The Short 184 was a World War I era single-engined two-seater biplane seaplane that saw operational use with a variety of air services from 1915 until 1933. The impetus for its development was the delivery of aerial torpedoes, but the nature of the aircraft meant that it was mostly used for reconnaissance and light bombing, later expanded to include anti-submarine patrols, and in post-war civilian service saw you limited use carrying passengers. Generally forgotten due to the larger air war over the Western Front, over 900 were manufactured, and it was in this aircraft that a couple of notable historical firsts were achieved, to wit the first ship sunk via an airborne torpedo, and as the only British aircraft to take part in the Battle of Jutland, it became the first aircraft to spot and report on the presence of an enemy fleet. This is also a sort of Christmas present to myself, as I've been meaning to do a couple of videos in which the short 184 plays an important role, but I got distracted by the Albatross D series. And yes, I do intend revisiting Albatross Flugzeugwerke and Robert Thelen and the story of the D5. Soon. At the outbreak of World War I, Short Brothers PLC had been manufacturing aircraft since November of 1908, when the company was founded by Horace Oswald and Eustace Short. I've seen the claim that this was the first manufacturer of production aircraft in the world, but this is arguable. Atelier d'Aviation Édouard Surcouf Blériot et Voisin was established in 1905, and following the Voisin brothers falling out with Louis Blériot, Appareil d'Aviation Les Frères Voisin was created in November of 1906. I suppose it comes down to what is meant by production, because the latter is credited with being the first commercial manufacturer of aircraft in the world. However, Short Brothers still exists, albeit as a subsidiary of Spirit Aerosystems, so it might qualify as the longest-running aircraft company in the world. The Brothers Short, without Horace, actually got their start in the aeronautical industry in 1902, selling balloons. In this they were moderately successful, including selling three to the British Indian Army in 1905. However, following the Wright Brothers' demonstration flights in France in 1908, Oswald reportedly observed to Eustace that this is the finish of ballooning, we must begin building aeroplanes at once, and we can't do that without Horace. So they did. Possibly because of their initial history, manufacturing balloons, orders began rolling in immediately. Examples of their early aircraft include the Wright Brothers Model A and the Dunn D5, both built under license, but Horace didn't waste any time getting into the designing of aircraft, revealing the short biplane number no. 1 in March of 1909. It was heavily influenced by Wright Brothers designs, but never flew, crashing onto its launching rail at the first attempt. The aircraft was damaged and never repaired, but nothing daunted, Horace Short moved on to other designs which were more successful. An early association was established with naval aviation when the first naval air service pilots learned to fly on short S-27 pusher biplanes. A modified version of one of these became the first aircraft to be launched from a moving ship on May 9, 1912, piloted by Commander C. R. Sampson. The S-27 gave rise to several variants, and in one form or another saw service in various roles until late 1914. For those interested in early short aircraft, it is important to know that the company did not, until after World War I, have type designations per se. Instead, aircraft were named for their serial numbers. Early on, the Short brothers were experimenting with aircraft equipped with floats, perhaps inevitable given their association with the Navy, and with tractor configuration biplanes with a certain degree of commercial success. In addition, in 1911 they developed what is claimed to be the world's first twin-engined aircraft, the S-39, or triple twin, with an unusual three-propeller layout having one propeller pushing and two pulling. 
The years 1911 and 1912 are significant with respect to launching torpedoes from an aircraft. The idea is not without some difficulty in implementation. Torpedoes are heavy, even a small one weighing about as much as two men, and the larger and more effective they got, the bigger the problem. This was a time when aircraft were basically underpowered, having enough trouble getting a pilot and enough fuel to do something useful into the air. So adding a large heavy object like a torpedo under the center line seriously compounds the issue. Even into the early part of World War I, it was normal for a two-seater bomber to fly without the observer to accommodate the weight of a small bomb load. Later in the war, it was preferred to fly the otherwise excellent Oreo HD-1 Scout with only one machine gun because of the weight of two affected performance. Despite the problems, the idea of an air-launched torpedo gained traction and was investigated by the Italians, the British and the Americans. Which of these was the first to come up with the idea is a matter of debate. An officer in the US Navy, one Bradley A. Fisk, was granted a patent in 1912 for the mechanics of carrying and releasing a torpedo from an aircraft, and he pushed the idea over the next few years. Unfortunately, US Congress didn't appropriate funds to develop the concept until 1917. For the purpose of this presentation, the Americans play no further role. In 1911, the British Admiralty received a paper written by Lieutenant Douglas Hyde Hyde Thompson no, I didn't stutter, following discussions with several of his peers, Captain Murray F. Sueter, Lieutenant Neville S. Bornham, and Lieutenant Lestrange Malone. The paper was worked out further and given specific form by a draftsman whose name has come down through history only as Bowden and through Captain Sueter, the aircraft manufacturer Sopwith was requested to build a suitable plane. Also in 1911, it is claimed that the Italians, in the form of Capitano Alessandro Guidoni, successfully dropped a small, 352 pounds, torpedo from a Farmon. There's some persuasiveness to this claim, given the Italians' noted innovation in the use of aircraft in warfare during the Italo-Turkish War of 1911-1912. However, attractive as the claim is, Capitano Guidoni's own account disputes it, saying that the idea wasn't presented to the Italian Navy until 1912 by the lawyer and inventor Raul Pateras Pescara, and that follow-up experiments in 1912 involved investigating the feasibility of dropping weights up to 176 pounds from an aircraft. Of the three, the British were first to successfully drop a torpedo from an aircraft. The Sopwith vehicle mentioned previously was not used. One account states that it was able to take off with a 14-inch torpedo in late 1913, but that for reasons going unrecorded it was not used to drop one. Another account, curiously by the same author, J. M. Bruce, states that it was unable to take off with the 900-pound missile loaded. Of the two, I favour the latter, as issues with having enough power to get into the air with such a load are part and parcel of this story. The honour of being first successfully taking off with and then launching a torpedo from an aircraft goes to Squadron Commander Arthur Murray Longmore in a short folder seaplane number 121 on 28th of July 1914. As a result of this test, also because Sopwith was involved in the production of other aircraft, Horace Short was approached with the basic specification that he produce a seaplane that could haul the heavy load into the air along with a pilot and fuel load using a 225 horsepower Sunbeam engine thought to be sufficient to the task. Horace's response is supposed to have been the rather British remark, well, if you particularly wish this done I will produce a seaplane that will satisfy you. And so he did. The world's first operational torpedo bomber was a large, unlovely two-seat seaplane powered by the requested 225 horsepower sunbeam, a V-12 side valve water-cooled piston engine later known as the Sunbeam Mohawk.
it cannot be said to be an elegant aircraft, as the lift requirements necessitated a huge wingspan in the form of a triple bay layout just over 63 feet wide. Fortunately, for stowage, the wings could be folded in a manner similar to the Short Brothers' early prototypes, starting with the S-41. Construction was pretty conventional, with a fabric-covered wooden frame, though tubular steel was used for the interplane and undercarriage struts. Weight was significant, at 3,700 pounds empty. Maximum loaded weight was just over 5,000 pounds, for comparison, the contemporary Vickers FB5 two-seater fighter weighed in at just over 2,000 pounds fully loaded. The Fokker Eindecker was a positively bantamweight 1,345 pounds. As might be expected, despite the 225 horsepower engine, more than double that of the scouts mentioned, performance was not stellar. Top speed was 75 miles per hour. Its ceiling was only 9,000 feet, and its climb to altitude can best be described as eventually. On the other hand, its job as designed was to lift a 900-pound torpedo into the air, and this it could do. Just about. It was more successful at this than other attempts by Sopwith or White, who also attempted torpedo bombers at the same time with less success, one problem with those was that they were severely underpowered, and the same can be said of the short 184, just that it was slightly less underpowered. The first flight of the short 184 occurred in early 1915, with the first two embarked on HMS Ben Mike Tree, which sailed for the Aegean on 21st March 1915 to participate in the Gallipoli campaign. It was during this deployment that the aircraft achieved a first of its firsts. Well, sort of. On August the 12th, 1915, Flight Commander Charles Edmonds became the first person to attack an enemy ship with an aerial torpedo, striking a 5,000-ton Turkish tanker at a range of around 800 yards, releasing at a height of around 15 feet. The vessel in question had already been torpedoed and shelled by a British submarine E-14 and was beached in shallow water, but as the first attack by a torpedo bomber, it still counts. Obviously, it wasn't sunk. However, another opportunity to be the first person to actually sink a ship came for Edmunds a few days later. On August 17th, he attacked another tanker successfully, such that it burned furiously and had to be taken to Constantinople. So he might have destroyed it, but he hadn't sunk it. That wasn't the end of the story, however, because the other short 184 was out that day as well, piloted by Flight Lieutenant G. B. Dacre. He experienced engine trouble, possibly overheating, and had to put down on the ocean still carrying his torpedo. With the engine recovered sufficiently, he attempted to taxi to safety when he encountered what has been described as a large Turkish steam tug. Perhaps inevitably, he reportedly taxied up to it and released his torpedo while still on the water. The tug was struck and sunk. This is the first time a ship had been sunk by a torpedo bomber. Relieved of the weight of his ordnance, Dacre was able to take off and return to HMS Ben Mai Tree. Quite what the crew of the tug thought about this, assuming any survived, is not recorded. Despite the fact that both pilots had to fly with reduced fuel and without an observer, this is a remarkably good start and demonstrated the potential of airborne torpedo delivery. Three torpedoes, three hits, one ship successfully sunk. However, it was clear that the short 184 was at best marginal as a torpedo bomber. Edmunds had this to say about the aircraft in this role. Unhappily, the torpedo-loaded short seaplane could only be made to get off the water and fly under ideal conditions. A calm sea with a slight breeze was essential, and the engine had to be running perfectly. Further, the weight of the torpedo so restricted the amount of petrol which could be carried that a flight of much more than three-quarters of an hour was not possible. 
However, when not encumbered by a torpedo, the aircraft proved quite successful in the reconnaissance role and as a light bomber, and in that guise continued to operate through to the end of the war and beyond. To summarize what the aircraft was like to fly, Flight Commander A. H. Shadwell, writing in 1936, gives a clear picture. He states that, it was a physical impossibility to fly a short at much more than 75 miles per hour. If you tried to dive it steeply, it would start taking the control away from you at, say, 65 miles per hour, and would have flattened itself out before it picked up another 10 miles an hour. No pilot was strong enough to hold the wheel forward so that it would continue to dive, and if he had been, he would probably have broken the control wires. Consequently, even if you had the height to spare, you could not get anywhere in a hurry, in a short, by stuffing its nose down, as you could with most land machines. Uh, basically, it was a very stable aircraft that wanted to say straight and level. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad characteristic for a bomber. Uh, despite his reservations regarding performance, Shadwell liked the short 184 as an aircraft well enough to describe it as the pilot's dream for putting in hours, docile, stable, obedient, and thoroughly deserving its affectionate nickname, Home from Home. Without a torpedo to laden it, the short 184 could carry a useful load. In addition to an observer, it could carry his Lewis gun and three 97-round drum magazines, and up to 520 pounds of bombs, depending on the configuration. Later in the war, a 300 pound depth charge could be carried. Endurance, depending upon the variant, could be up to five hours. It was without a torpedo and acting as a reconnaissance aircraft that it achieved its second historical first. On the evening of May 30th, 1916, the British Grand Fleet put to sea from its bases at Scarpa Flow, the Cromarty Firth, and Rosyth, having been informed that the German High Seas Fleet was about to sail into the North Sea. Accompanying the battle cruiser fleet out of Rosyth was the seaplane carrier HMS Engadine, carrying two short 184s and two Sopwith Baby single-seat seaplanes. At 14.20 hours on May 31st, the light cruiser HMS Galatea signalled enemy in sight, and at 14.40, Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty ordered Engadine to send a seaplane to scout to the north-northeast. Within half an hour of the signal, one of the shorts was airborne, with Lieutenant Frederick Joseph Rutland, pictured on the far left, as a pilot, and Assistant Paymaster George Stanley Truin, for whom I could not find a photograph, as an observer. At 15.30, Truin signalled the Engadine that they had spotted three German cruisers and five destroyers. This was the first time that a heavier-than-air aircraft had carried out a reconnaissance of an enemy fleet in action. After a few other spot reports were transmitted, the aircraft's fuel line ruptured around 15.36, and Rutland was forced to put his aircraft down. He was able to repair it, and signalled that he was ready to take off again, but he was ordered to taxi to the carrier on the surface. The aircraft reached the ship at 1547, and it was hoisted aboard by 1604. Engadine attempted to relay the spot reports to Beatty's flagship, and to the flagship of the 5th Battle Squadron, but was unsuccessful. Rutland was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, for his gallantry and persistence in flying within close distance of enemy light cruisers. For his exploits, he earned the nickname Rutland of Jutland. His story doesn't end there, and has an interesting and unexpected twist to it that I shall cover in another video. Vice Admiral Beatty recognized Rutland and Truin's work, stating, Owing to clouds, it was necessary to fly very low, and in order to identify four light cruisers, the seaplane had to fly at 900 feet within 3,000 yards of them, the light cruisers opening fire on her with every gun that would bear. This in no way interfered with the clarity of their reports, and both Flight Lieutenant Rutland and Assistant Paymaster Truin are to be congratulated on their achievement, which indicates that seaplanes in such circumstances are of distinct value. 
Uh, now, with something like over 900 machines manufactured, it might be something of a surprise that the short 184 was as successful as it was. In a war where faster reconnaissance aircraft and light bombers were to achieve 140 miles an hour, how could something half that fast be successful? The difference is the operational arena. The Echo DH-4, I was referring to previously, had to operate over the Western Front, which was a vastly more challenging environment. Aircraft like the Short 184 operated over the ocean, where the threat to them was significantly less. Additionally, the threat from anti-aircraft fire from ships was minimal. Factors like endurance and the ability to take off from and land on the water were more important. Additionally, its bomb load was quite respectable compared with its land-based contemporaries. This mini-documentary has gone on quite long, and as such I'm inclined to cover the operational history at another time. Suffice it to say, the short 184 went on to be Short Brothers' most successful aircraft until World War II. However, Horace Oswald and Eustace themselves were no longer involved, as the company they started was nationalised in 1919. Their aircraft soldiered on without them, stolid, unspectacular and unobtrusively gallant, remaining in Royal Naval Service until 1922, and in service with other nations until 1933. The only surviving short 184 consists of an unrestored fuselage on display at the Fleet Air Arm Museum. Appropriately, it is the aircraft flown by Rutland and Truin at the Battle of Jutland.